evening. I had a chance to fly this uh, pretty little Bristel light sport aircraft. This is from VRM Aero. This is a Czech company. And the man behind the airplane bears mention here. His name is Milan Bristel, uh, very much like this, except with just one L. Uh, he is a man who has been associated with aircraft that look like this one since the first ones arrived on the market. I call this one kind of a fifth generation design because it's very similar to the originals that came out that look very much like this but this one has got so many different kinds of refinements on it subtle things like the shape of the fuselage and other things like the design of the interior and the refinement of the control system you sum all those things up and you end up with what I think is kind of a superior product in this particular airframe. So let's look at the basic construction of it first. Obviously, like all these airplanes, there are a certain amount of composite because in shapes like cowling, composites always work the very best. However, an awful lot of this is an all metal design, a riveted design, but a very nice job of riveting. The camera can't see this right here, but these are pulled rivets, but they are, the, they are so nicely achieved, they look like buck rivets. Um, and that's carried all the way through. There's another change to the airplane that I think is significant, and that goes over this smooth canopy, but as it tapers on down to the aft fuselage, that transition is now nice and smooth. In the earlier ones, there was kind of an abrupt finish to it, and the original one is still that way, and maybe that's not an issue for aerodynamics, but it is kind of a visual issue. And there are a lot of things like that. I want to point out another thing down here that's kind of unusual. This little shaping that's done on the nose wheel uh, steering. And, and this has conventional steering on it, which is nice too, as opposed to uh, castering wheel. When I mentioned the canopy just a second ago, I said that there was one thing I wanted to point out. And that is that you may not be able to see it too well here, but there's a opaque cover over the top of that that keeps the cockpit from getting quite so hot in warm conditions and yet still allows you immense visibility and that's quite nice uh, you don't need to look straight up over your head very often if you do you can always tilt your head a little bit and look straight up for traffic for example uh, but it makes it a lot more comfortable inside that said this aircraft, as it sits here right now on a really hot day, would require you to have the canopy open somewhat uh, because there, it's enough of a seal around the canopy to the fuselage and there is no, you notice there's no inlets here. The inlets are down here and they bring in plenty of air once you're moving, but while you're standing still, it can get pretty warm in there. So they actually have a neat little gizmo. There's a piston on each side here that holds the canopy up and with a little tiny aluminum piece that he slips into place, it'll prop the canopy open for you while you're taxing. If you've got the canopy open a few inches while you're taxing, it's much more comfortable inside. As you can see here, they're using the Rotax 912 IS. That's the fuel-injected engine, and they're spinning a, a three-bladed. Uh, they're using the uh, uh, Fiti prop up front, but they are switching over now to the Duke Elise prop. So they will have that beautiful black prop from the folks in France uh, that more and more people seem to be accepting, and that, I think, will uh, be a good thing for this company to coordinate with that. Some of these aircraft use a step up here. This one uses more conventional step in the rear, but there is, you can't, the camera probably can't see it, but there is a step down there. Uh, you can use the bulkhead uh, to get up front. And because the canopy rises up, you do have to um, kind of work your way into the seat, but there's a nice little handhold right down there. If I was able to reach through the canopy, you'd see there's a good place to grip while you get in. There's also the camera might be able to see between the two seats back there, there's a very secure, solid bulkhead and there's a nice handle there. So those are the means you use. And once you're inside, this is a, I don't have the number on its cabin width, but it's one of the largest width cabins in the game. And it's very comfortable inside. Uh, the seats are typical with a bulkhead right behind the seats. The seats don't move, but the rudder pedals do adjust. There's a little, oh, about a, a U half U-shaped uh, handle on either side of the cockpit. You pull that, and the rudder pedals jump back toward you. They're spring-loaded toward you, which, of course, is what you want. And then you just push them back out while continuing to hold that lever to the place where it works for you. And of course you can adjust them at any time. So that's the main adjustment. If you need other height adjustments, you just use a cushion, which I used in mine. And I found that the uh, seats in the aircraft 
remarkably, we're quite comfortable. I say remarkably because a lot of people don't put a lot of thought into seat design. It's great for young guys or something that don't have any uh, issues, but some of us older pilots uh, prefer a more comfortable seat. A couple more things that I see on the outside here. There's a locker right here. You may not be able to see it, but I'm kind of motioning my hand around how large that is, a good bit of area to get in there. Uh, there's also lockers out here on the wing. There's one right here that I'm kind of pointing out the width of it. And then fueling systems happen out here on each side. And uh, it's 16 gallons per side, so that's 32 gallons and, you know, minus a little bit that's not usable. You've got an immense range on this airplane. With the uh, 912 IS burning about four gallons an hour, well, you can do the math yourself, but it's a lot of endurance on this airplane. One of the reasons why we wanted to fly this particular airplane is because this company, uh, in addition to just a couple of other ones in the business, has decided that they're going to pursue the IFR, instrument flying rules, capability for this airplane. Now, there are those that will tell you, oh no, you can't do that kind of flying in a light sport aircraft. And that's got a little bit of truth, but is mostly wrong. There has never been a prohibition that says you cannot fly this airplane that way. There has been advice by industry groups not to pursue that without some standards that really define it well, and those standards have been difficult to really create. But there's a way you can do this, and these folks have really hit on one of the important parts, and that is this. This is a special light sport aircraft. That means it's fully built, and they don't even offer a kit in this country anyway for the Bristol airplanes. But it's always possible if you have special light sport aircraft, fully built approval, that you can then, once you've got that, then you can make a, what's called an ELSA, or experimental light sport aircraft, and that doesn't mean you need to build any part of it in particular. It can be any percentage. They could have you put a single bolt on it or something or do nothing whatsoever. And just the change from SLSA to ELSA status triggers some changes. One thing it means is that you cannot use it for paid flight instruction or rental anymore. However, it does mean that the owner can make whatever changes he wants to it after that point. Now, if he makes a number of changes to it, then it's a one-way trip. It's SLSA to ELSA status, and that's where it stays. However, if the owner doesn't change anything, if he just uses it differently, uh, that allows him to meet um, a number of the... Uh, Federal Aviation Regulation is called 91.205, which lists some equipment that you have to have in an airplane to be able to use it for instrument flight rule flying. And that list is actually not that daunting, and they can meet that easily. So this airplane has a whole bunch of glass along the front. Two big uh, uh, Garmin G3X screens. That's a wonderful uh, uh, device to have in front of you, and they've got two large screens of that flanking a Garmin 796, so it's pretty much a Garmin suite in their, L in their IFR version. But they've also got a couple of round dial, old-fashioned gauges for airspeed, for altimeter, and like that, so that uh, if, the, if the screens all went dark, you still got something else. And that's one part of the requirement in those FARs that suggest how it can be used. Then it is absolutely permitted once you've done those things, and you have to pick a certified engine as well, which the uh, uh, Rotax company can supply. They've met that standard and no problem. Same engine, but with paperwork to accompany it so that it's uh, an approved aircraft engine for IFR flying. And then you can use this airplane for IFR. Now, a big question some people ask is, what about IMC, which is an abbreviation that means Instrument Meteorological Conditions? And that's basically flying in the clouds, if you will, in actual weather, not just filing for IFR and having them follow your flight and keep track of you, which by itself is a value. But if you actually want to, for example, take off from this airport, punch through some clouds, and then be in clear air and land at your destination without problem, that would require flying in IMC conditions. And uh, there's some still questions about whether or not that's permitted and what it takes to do that. But if you meet that minimum equipment list and if you have the right engine, and if you've done the documentation that's required, and, and if the pilot is qualified, the pilot has to have an IFR rating and has to be current. But if you do all those things, yes, you can take this airplane and go through those clouds and do that. This company, unlike nearly every other company in the game, has an opportunity for you. They call it uh, sh their shares program, and you can buy a one-eighth ownership of this airplane. And 
you know, you can't do that everywhere at every time, but they'll help work with you to establish other people that can become your partner, and the company itself will, the U.S. company itself, will help you make that happen if you want to do that and if you can assist them with some other possible people. So you take whatever the price of this thing, one-eighth of that is a pretty good deal, and there's some other requirements that go along with it, but they're quite agreeable. We've done a video about that as well, and we'll... Uh, uh, encourage you to go have a look at that to find out more about that. But there is a way folks with a smaller budget can afford one of these nice IFR capable airplanes if you want that. You don't have to get the IFR to do that, any of their models that can apply to. So it depends on what you want. But contact the folks at Bristel USA and find out how to do that. And you can do that by just going to their website, which is just like the name here, Bristel.com. You can find more about the Bristel and all kinds of affordable aviation products on bydanjohnson.com. Thanks for coming along with us here in the BRM Aero Bristol.